Let's kick this off. Um, welcome everyone to our Spring webinar series. Today, I'm super excited. We have Ben Williams, who is a PLG expert. Um, he's going to be talking through defining your ideal customer profile with um, real life examples and how to do that. We also have Denise from the Sprig team who is going to connect um, all the things that Ben is saying, and she's going to be essentially show you how to do it in Sprig. Um, so Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. And thanks, Anne and, and Denise and the rest of the Sprig team for, for having me. I'm, you know, really excited today to to get to talk about one of my favorite topics but um, before we get into that um, I'll share a little bit about myself uh, and what I've been up to so I've been working in product and growth for over 20 years now uh, my last couple of operator roles were leading product at Cloudbees which is uh, an enterprise DevOps company uh, and most recently at uh, a company called Sneak, cybersecurity company, where I led all things around product-led growth, around education and the developer experience. It was in uh, 2022 that I went out on my own uh, as an advisor to, to founders uh, and to heads of product and heads of growth at uh, post-product market fit startups. Uh, who are looking to scale their PLG native businesses or or layer on PLG to their sales led businesses. And, you know, in, in every early conversation I have with product people at the companies I work with, um, we inevitably come to the topic of ICPs. It's something that is really fundamental to the success of initiatives across the board at startups uh, and nowhere more so than in terms of product decisions. So I've been really looking forward to this session where we can uh, where we can dig deeper into the subject. So what we'll cover today, I'm going to take a look at how I think about ideal customer profiles, just get everyone on the same page about what an ICP is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, why ICPs are important in the in the context of uh, of growth. Uh, we'll give a blueprint really for for how to define your ICP with some kind of practical uh, tips and tricks and and tools you can use to to do so. Uh, and we'll cover a little bit about some of the challenges that that we face with uh, with ICPs. Okay, so without further ado, um, let's talk ICPs. Uh, I do want to start with the basics, uh, and I want to actually give you all thirty seconds or so to. Uh, to drop a single sentence definition of an ICP into the chat. Um, and then I'll share uh, how I think about ICPs. But if you could just quickly drop into chat, single sentence, how you think about an ICP. So I see some here like a uh, description of your high priority users, what their needs are, how your product solves their problems, a unique representation of your target customer, your most important target customer that aligns with your business strategy, uh, customers for whom your product would work best. These are all kind of, I think, directionally um, interesting and directionally correct answers. Um, but I'm going to share how I think about ICP. So. This is the definition that I use that uh, I think most simply characterizes how I think about ICPs, uh, especially considering how I think they should be best used. So an ideal customer profile is a description of the hypothetical perfect customer for a business's product or service. And you'll notice that I've highlighted the word perfect um, and that's actually something that's pretty important in how I think about ICPs, but we're going to come back to that shortly. So 
Um, first, I want to take a look at some of the ingredients that I like to use in this uh, description of our hypothetical perfect customer. So um, I've found that teams find it hard to get the right level of detail in an ICP. You should be, I think, able to describe your ICP in a one pager uh, or a single chart. You want enough detail in the definition that provides a solid focus to your product and go to market work, but not too much. You know, too much detail can uh, result in, I think, unnecessary complexity in your sales and marketing initiatives, and it can leave no room for, for discovery and experimentation. And remember, because your, your market is never static, overly detailed ICPs um, will become stale and less relevant to your business more quickly. On the other hand, you know, if you have too little detail, then you just don't get the benefits of focus that, that a great ICP brings. So these are the, uh, the 10 characteristics that I recommend capturing. Uh, and I'll give some examples um, as if we are a, a CRM, a customer relationship management product company. So one thing to, to bear in mind as I walk through these, that the right level of specificity in each of these areas is going to vary depending on your business. So first of all, um, the first thing I like to capture is which market and, and industry does our hypothetical perfect customer operate in? So an example here uh, for our CRM company might be tech slash sales and marketing. Next, we want to capture which geographies our perfect customer operates in. For example, North America, EMEA, and UK. A valid answer here might be global too. Now, remember that I said that the right level of specificity is going to vary depending on your business, depending on your unique context. So for some products and services, the right answer might be wide reaching. For example, if we're focusing on geo, it might be a global uh, geographical focus. While for others, it might be more narrow. For example, that, that geographical focus might be just for the UK. So the two questions you have to ask yourself when thinking this through is, one, um, are there any notable differences between customers with these characteristics? For example, do they evaluate and purchase software differently? Uh, do they have different needs and problems? So that's the first thing, that customer perspective. And the second is, are there any notable differences in our ability as a company to serve customers with those characteristics? You know, do we have the right coverage, the right skills, knowledge, uh, experience, infrastructure, and processes? Um, and this thought process for decisions, I think, applies to all of the criteria shown on this slide. Um, so on to number three, uh, the size of the customer. We typically characterize this by the number of employees the perfect customer has. Uh, and it's typically in ranges that make sense for your business. So our, our example here might be scale-ups with 50 to 250 employees. Number four is describing what relevant problems our perfect customer has. The word relevant is actually really important because uh, we don't want to just list out every single problem that, that customers might be looking to solve. We want to narrow down on the few problems that we solve as a, as a vendor or that we want to solve. So an example here for us might be in managing, uh, difficulty of managing client relationships and in tracking sales activities. Number five is digging deeper into that problem space to understand why the relevant problems are um, problems that are important enough for those perfect customers to want to solve. So we're looking at the implications of them not solving those problems. So an example would be lost sales opportunities, lower customer retention, and reduced revenue. Number six takes a departure from the overall company characteristics and starts to focus on who within our perfect customer would be using the product. Now, if you have a horizontal product that can serve many different use cases for pretty much anybody, then being more prescriptive here can be really beneficial for earlier stage startups, even though, you know, the plan would be to expand that focus later on. With our CRM example, uh, our user roles would be sales reps, sales managers, and customer service managers. With number seven, we look at another important role, 
but it's not the user. This time it's the buyer. And we ask ourselves who's involved in the buying process. So for our CRM example, we'd have CROs, chief revenue officers, sales leaders, heads of CS. Number eight is the buying process. And we're trying to characterize how our perfect customer buys software like ours. So in the market that we're targeting with our CRM, the typical buying process might be a trial sign up, self-serve evaluation, a hand raise or a usage-based triggered outreach from our sales team, some engagement with an account exec, internal procurement approval, uh, and ultimately sign off from the, the CRO or head of sales. Number nine describes the existing technology landscape at our perfect customer. So the example here would be companies that are using spreadsheets or legacy outdated CRM systems. Maybe they emphasize the use of data analytics for, for their customer insights. And last but not least, I do like to include in, in the definition of an ICP this catch-all for additional criteria. So it's not always used, um, but in our CR CRM example, we might include, for example, companies that are impacted by GDPR and, and CCPA. Okay, and this is what it might look like when you lay that out on an ICP canvas. Um, this time using an example from an API dev and test platform as opposed to our CRM example. But I like to lay these, these ICPs out into a, uh, a canvas because it's something that's readily shared, nice and easy to, to digest. And, and also when you're thinking through the, the problem space is, uh, uh, is a great kind of uh, template to, to uh, work from. One important kind of concept as well is um, something that I think can be really helpful, and that's to develop this anti-ICP. So I've seen this done uh, as a companion document, but I personally think it's a little bit more useful when it's added to the core definition of an ICP. So the role of the anti-ICP is to be super explicit in saying that if we see customers with this given characteristic, we won't do product and go-to-market work to support them if that work isn't also beneficial to our ICP. So it's important to understand that this is different from just the things that we don't explicitly include in our ICP. You know, our ICP might be, for example, uh, have customer size of 50 to 250 employees. Um, and we might note an anti-ICP characteristic of sub-50 employees because typically the contract value for those uh, for those uh, com uh, companies would be below our sales floor. Uh, but we'd still sell to larger companies, larger than 50 to 250, despite our focus uh, in what we build and take to market being around that kind of scale up 50 to 250 size uh, company. Of course, just like your ICP or your anti-ICP characteristics can change over time. Okay, so how ICPs fuel growth in PLG. Let's switch gears a little bit now and, and talk about, I think, how product and go-to-market teams can really best leverage a well-defined ICP. So remember how we define an ICP. Uh, it's a description of the hypothetical perfect customer for a business's product or service. And remember how I said the word perfect was important. Let's focus on, on that for a while and imagine what it would be like if we had a perfect customer or more specifically what it would be like if we had a significant part of the market that were filled with perfect customers and let's play through some scenarios so if we had a perfect customer then our product would perfectly meet their needs the fit would be exact you know we'd solve their specific set of problems exceptionally well and they'd be left wanting for nothing. If we had a perfect customer, then our messaging would resonate perfectly with them. It would speak to them directly and feel to them as if they were in kind of a one-to-one -one situation with us and we were talking only with them. If we had a perfect customer, our language would perfectly align with theirs. So we'd adopt their lingo, industry-specific terms and colloquialisms so that they feel that we really understand them. If we had a perfect customer, our pricing would perfectly align with their willingness to pay. So 
they'd feel that they were neither overpaying nor underpaying for our product. If we had a perfect customer, our onboarding would perfectly support them building habits around the product. We'd effortlessly connect new users and teams to the core value of our product, and we'd guide them on this path that makes them want to keep returning to use our product to solve their problem. If we had a perfect customer, our outbound engagement would be perfectly welcome. When and how we reach out to prospects would be at the time and in the manner that they're most receptive to it. If we had a perfect customer, our account-based marketing would perfectly connect us with their buyers. So the right accounts would be targeted and the right potential buyers would be identified. The right personalized strategies would be developed and deployed to quickly connect with key decision makers. If we had a perfect customer, our PQA scoring, our product qualified account scoring would perfectly predict propensity to buy. So we'd understand our customer usage data so well that we'd have a product usage based scoring model that enabled the sales team to prioritize engagement with the right accounts at the right time. And if we had a perfect customer, then our PLS, our product led sales playbooks would perfectly convert prospects into customers. We'd run the right playbooks at the right time, and each playbook would perfectly nurture the opportunity to a closed one state. That all sounds amazing, right? But um, here's the thing. Given that we understand our perfect customer, we have to come back to reality, I'm sorry, and acknowledge that our business, our product, and our go-to-market is imperfect. It's not perfect, at least not yet, right? And in all honesty, for many reasons, it probably never will be. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for perfection. And that's, I think, the role of an ICP here. So a great ICP allows us to bridge the gap between where we are now in all of those areas and where we'd need to be if we were to perfectly align with the needs and behaviors of our ideal customers. So a great ICP is a guide, it's a bridge. And that distance between where we are now and where we need to be, I call that the ICP gap. So it's the gap between where you are today and where you need to be in order to optimally serve your ICP. In some areas, the gap might be small. In other areas, it might be significant. But a great ICP provides a directional beacon for all of your product and go-to-market efforts. So when you're working on your product, your messaging, your language, your pricing, your onboarding, your approach to outbound, your ABM, uh, your product-led sales scoring and playbooks, how can you hope to optimize those things if you don't have a clear understanding of who you're optimizing them for? And the answer is you can't. And that's why having a well-defined ICP is so critical. A well-defined ICP, a great ICP, it provides this focus for you to be able to evolve each of those areas that I outlined in support of your growth. Your perfect customers are out there. What you have to do, what your job is, is to understand who those perfect customers are, to document them, and then to align, focus, and evolve your business around those customers. But let's take a, a step back now and, and take a look at some of the ways that we can get started defining our ICP. So the first area to focus on is probably an obvious one, but it's listening to user and customer feedback. You've got to be right there in the trenches, interacting with customers, listening to what they've got to say. There's really no substitute for getting close to and talking with customers and potential customers. Look and listen for which customers and prospects are providing the most positive feedback. Look to product reviews, look to demos, social media, support dialogues, 
moderated research sessions and so on. All of those are kind of valuable areas where the signals will be there and you've got to look for those kind of positive sentiments there. When thinking about your anti-ICP, of course, are there any segments of the market that are consistently providing negative feedback? Because they might not be the right customers for you, right? But just be careful with that one because sometimes, sometimes there are actually very vocal customers that may be early adopters. They might be passionately engaging with you um, and asking you to continuously improve because they want to see your product evolve um, and they want to see that gap between where your product is now and their needs, they want to see that close. So user and customer feedback is, is the first area. The next area to look at is usage data. So PLG companies appreciate the importance of instrumenting their products so that they can uncover valuable behavioral insights. Delve into that quantitative data to be able to ask and answer questions. Like who is using the product in a manner that's most aligned with the natural problem frequency? Who's activating at higher rates? Who's engaging with the product most deeply? Who's retaining best over the long term? And for the anti-ICP, think about the inverse of these things. You know, look for negative patterns. Where is usage-based churn most prevalent? Uh, which segments of customers have lower activation? Which segments have lower engagement? So usage data, that's the second. Third is marketing and sales. And marketing and sales provide another really excellent source of input when defining your ICP. Um, you can look at uh, quant data like ad campaign performance, uh, email response rates, website conversion, as well as qualitative data in the form of feedback from, from cold outreach. And of course, similarly, Look for those negative patterns uh, in terms of informing your anti-ICP. So marketing and sales. The next one is revenue data. And, and I think this is a really fantastic place to look when, when you're um, working on defining your ICP. Most of the time with PLG, you know, we're focused on moving the metrics that will lead to lagging shifts in, in revenue. You know, we're, we're focused on those leading indicators. But revenue remains the ultimate high confidence signal that you're meeting a market need very well. So there's a bunch of really interesting signals we can look for in this area. You know, which segments have the highest win rate? Who's demonstrating uh, higher net revenue retention? Where is expansion most common? Where is the sales process uh, most frictionless? And where do we see the shortest sales cycles? And contrastingly, we may consider kind of outliers on the on the other end of the spectrum in these areas when we think about our anti-ICP. So ask, you know, where are you losing most often? Where do you see most contraction and, and churn? So that's revenue data. Next up, unit economics. This is another really important area to look for patterns in. You know, I've found it personally to be a, a great additional perspective, especially when, when you interleave it with the other sources of, uh, of input. Uh, you know, particularly in the current environment, yielding higher profitability, it's often an important business goal. So narrowing your ICP focus to support that goal can be really beneficial. You know, let's say you have an ICP definition that is spanning multiple verticals. You know, at first, it might seem appropriate, it might seem perfectly logical, because those, those verticals share the same problem. Um, or a similar enough problem that your product can help them solve. But when you look deeper into that unit economics data, you can find that some of those verticals might be really costly to acquire new customers in, or that some of them have much higher churn rates than others. So digging into which segments have higher lifetime values, LTVs, and which have higher and lower uh, CAC payback periods can give you really important insight. So that's unit economics. And last, but but certainly not least, we have surveys. And I think of this last one really as, as a bit of a cheat code. Um, and I promise Sprig didn't pay me to say that. But the reason that surveys are so powerful in the context of defining your ICP, because you know they've got a lot of other uses as well, but in the context of defining your ICP, is I think they can be used in two ways. 
So the first is to directly gather data from users and customers that can inform our ICP definition. So we might, for example, run a product market fit survey where we ask users how disappointed they'd be if they could no longer use our product. And the second way that they can be used is in better understanding the makeup of your users and customers in, in such a way that you get a lot more flexibility in how you segment and cohort the analysis you do in all the other five areas that we've covered. So we can use product uh, in product surveys to understand, you know, user roles, user intent, why they've signed up, what problems they're here to solve and, and use that data in, in a segmenting uh, and cohorting capacity. And we might also, you know, ex explicitly ask users to tell us the size of their company and the industry they work in. Enrichment, of course, is 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 never perfect and particularly struggles with social signups. So asking for this type of data directly um, can really help. And what I love most about in-product surveying is that you can get the right set of questions in front of the right set of users at exactly the right time when their motivation is high. I think one of the most important times and places to, to survey users is, is actually during the onboarding flow. It can be a gold mine of information in the context of um, defining your ICP. Other reasons, of course, for personalizing uh, onboarding and the likes, but in the context of defining your ICP, onboarding is a great place to be asking relevant, pertinent questions. But there's a commonly perpetuated myth that you know onboarding surveys add friction and friction is bad, right? Well, no. Um, the reality is that not all friction is bad. You know, there's what I class as healthy friction um, deployed at the right time that can create greater user investment in the onboarding process and even lead to improved activation rates. And, you know, without good profiling data, you can't personalize the onboarding experience and you'll inevitably waste time and effort on users that, that really shouldn't be your focus. I won't spend too much time on this slide because, you know, I know that Denise is going to demo all of the in-product survey capabilities in Sprig. But what I will say is that we had really amazing success with using Sprig for in-product surveys during my time at, at Sneak. Um, it's a super powerful platform that... Um, you know, when we think about ICP and other use cases, it's something you absolutely uh, should check out. So the challenge with all of this, um, I do want to quickly highlight this, and that is that ICPs are a moving target. You know, you have to continuously evolve your ICP. The market that you're in won't be standing still user and customer needs and expectations are going to evolve. That's a given, just take that. Users will start using your product in ways that you never envisaged. Your product strategy is gonna change as the market changes um, and you seek out new growth opportunities. There might be mergers and acquisitions. You might have organic multi-product expansion and that may even create needs for, for multiple ICPs, for more than one ICP. So you and your teams, you know, are constantly trying to bridge that ICP gap that I described to much more closely align with your ICP. But at the same time, your ICP is evolving. You know, it's never ending. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just reality that we need to be aware of. You don't want to be making constant knee-jerk changes but you should plan to periodically review and update your definition and realign your teams so that everyone is always working against a definition that most accurately reflects your ideal customer. And a little tip as you evolve it, uh, a change log can be a really useful addition to, to your ICP definition. So to close this out, let's reflect on what we covered. One, an ICP is a description of the hypothetical perfect customer for a business's product or service. The perfect part, that's really important because it allows us to imagine a situation of complete synergy between customers on one hand and our offer on the other. I like to focus on those 10 key characteristics in an ICP uh, definition, the marketing industry, geography, company size, problems, problem implications, user roles, buyer roles, 
the buying process, technographics, and a catch-all for all other important criteria. Two, we use our ICP to understand where and what gaps we have in our product and in our go-to-market so we can focus on the right work to better align our offer with the market. A great ICP is the blueprint for a bridge we can cross to continuously improve. Three, we use a variety of tools, including surveys, to help us define our ICP, combining qualitative and quantitative data from many different sources. And fourth, a reminder that your ICP is not static. You need to consider your ICP definition as a living artifact that needs constant maintenance. And that's me done. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat that I want to um, highlight. Um, so this question came back from when you were going over the 10 um, aspects that go into an ICP. Is the tech stack and the workflow that the user uses to accomplish some job too much detail or not? I think it, it depends on the context. One thing I didn't really mention that I probably should have is that think of those 10 characteristics as, as a starter. Um, there may be some situations where some of that data is more or less relevant, right? Um, and you need to apply that context in, in, uh, in your own uh, business. So I think going back to that decision-making process, you need to ask, if we had this information, would it change how we approach things? So are there any significant differences between customers who have this tech stack versus customers who have this tech stack? Um, and secondly, are, we, are there any significant differences in our ability to serve customers with those two different tech stacks? For example, if we're, if we've got some customers who are currently using kind of manual processes and, and maybe spreadsheets to, to do some kind of work, and then they've got, we've got others that are, they've got an existing system, perhaps that existing system, it would be a really difficult uh, challenge for us in our sales cycle to, to kind of lift and shift and displace that incumbent technology. And so that's not going to be our focus. Whereas, you know, we're going to focus on those greenfield accounts who don't have an existing solution beyond um, spreadsheets. Um, so there's an example of, of where it might be appropriate and, and relevant. There are other situations where perhaps the difference, it, it really doesn't make a difference. And so that would be something that is weighted less in your own ICP definition. Thanks, Ben. Um, one more question. ICP versus ECP, early adopters, what's your view on this? Is that question from Marja? It is, yeah. <laughs> hey, um, so um, I love that take around starting with uh, an ECP, uh, early customer profile and moving to an I ideal customer profile. Um, my perspective is really that kind of your uh, your ECP is really just your first incarnation of an ICP um, and it's and it might be markedly different from where you are as a as a, a company that is um, achieved product market fit and is now scaling uh, and it's and it, therefore it's really important kind of delineation to make but I think you can still think of it in terms of that overall framework of um, this is the customer that we're that we're striving to serve, and that is going to change over time. It just happens that in your early days, it's probably changing more rapidly, and you want to uh, focus more specifically uh, and more narrowly early on. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to pass it over to Denise who is going to show us how to put a lot of the things that Ben mentioned into practice using Sprig. Awesome. 
Um, well, I'll go ahead and share my screen here, but thanks, Ben, for going through that. Tons of great info um, and great hearing it from your perspective there. So with that, we'll definitely dive into how you can utilize Sprig, especially for those in product surveys. Um, and then with that, again, feel free to input any questions as we navigate through, but we'll run through the in product survey question setup, targeting, and then dive into the analysis and how Sprig will instantly analyze the responses, especially from open text and how we utilize our AI model. So with that, you know, uh, the screen that we see in front of us, this is the Sprig platform. And what's really great is we do have over 75 templates that are created by expert researchers, but we also have great templates. Like you can see this one here created specifically from Ben, um, but tons of other people in this space that are experts. Um, and I think a good one to dive into this example would be the onboarding um, template that we have here. So you'll notice here tons of different templates, again, depending on use cases, great way to brainstorm questions, different follow up questions. But really, one of the key value adds of Sprig is when you're thinking about asking any in app or in product survey, you really want to make it feel like it's a part of your brand and product. So we do offer full customization for these in app surveys on both your web, mobile web and mobile apps. So you can have those in app surveys feel like they're a part of your product there. And then for an example, even when I do select a pre cater template, you still have full range of control, but you'll see these are very targeted. You want to start off with a close ended question, have any desired skip logic. And then, of course, if you want to ask an open ended question at the end to gather additional feedback, um, this is where our AI model will run through those open text responses there, which I'll showcase here at the end. And then here, once the questions have been set up, really the power of Sprig comes in in the targeting, like Ben was mentioning, in that precise moment, really, you know, defining in the user journey where we want to present the in-app survey. So this is me selecting, okay, I want to deliver this on our web application. And what's really great is Sprig is a one-time install. So once you've installed Sprig, you can set up and run these in-app surveys um, in any user flow that you would like. And then you would send over these key actions or key events that really, again, are triggering that in-app survey. So did they just complete creating their account for the first time? And again, with timing, timing is super important. So again, maybe we want to add a couple of seconds for a delay. So that way, again, you're giving that end user some time to process the info. But again, you're getting that response from them instantly after that experience. And then from there, we also have a second layer of targeting, especially if you're wanting to target specific user roles or personas, maybe again, you're offering that free trial um, or again, different plan types. Anything that you're already tracking amongst your users can be utilized to target these in product surveys. So maybe I do want to track conversion and you do offer that starter plan or that free trial plan and you want to target users that are opting in for that and then actually only showcase this in-app survey to that user group. So you can get really advanced in the in-app targeting within Sprig, um, but then you can also filter results after the fact. If you didn't define a specific user group, you can always filter the results based off of these user attributes. But really, again, you can add any additional skip logic, add additional attributes in there, but then you can also even define user groups based off of actions, based off of either occurrences that they've done certain things, um, or again, X days ago. So you can get pretty advanced here and you'll notice just within a couple of minutes, I'm able to create my survey easily click launch here. And then from there, we'll dive into the analysis here. So Sprig overall does tend to see a higher response rate, anywhere from 30 to 40%. Again, it's really due to the level of customization that we offer and that level of targeting. The question feels very relevant to the end user. And again, it's that close ended question first. So they're more likely to respond directly within that moment. You can always dive into this analysis and see users that qualify, users that are receiving the surveys. We have a lot of great analytics there. 
But really the power of Sprig is when you're actually diving into the results. So for your rating scale or multiple choice, you'll get these easy to read visuals. I can even change the visual representation there. But when we actually dive down here to the open text responses, this is where you'll start to see these themes based off of open text responses. So we hear time and time again from our customers how big of a value add this is. And really what we do here at Sprig is very different than other tools out there in the space that are using a keyword search or word cloud approach. There doesn't need to be overlapping words in our responses for AI model to group them together. We're really looking at the context of what these end users are saying. So for example, you know, if they're saying registration or sign up, essentially the context is the same. And then that's why our AI model is grouping them together in this overarching theme. So essentially Sprig has built and trained our own in-house A model over many, many years. And then we also rolled out the utilization of GBT4 to make the process a lot more accurate and faster. And then with that, as you continue utilizing Sprig, you'll really start to see these themes that get grouped together in your product terminology, your user terminology. So that way, again, they're more and more relevant to you. Not only will you get the theme, you'll also get a sentence that's, again, providing even more context to the theme itself. Another great thing about our AI is if one response has, it's pretty lengthy or has, you know, multiple pieces of context in there, one response can be tied to multiple themes. Um, so again, you can have that there. So that would be our open text AI. You'll see all of those themes there. Not only will you get that, at AI model, you actually can provide, we also provide AI insights that provide top key takeaways from that survey itself. So we'll provide this AI insights around the top two or three takeaways, but then not only will you get that, you actually can also interact with an AI chatbot. So one, you can actually see suggested prompts, and then these are suggested prompts based off of the context of the survey itself but you can even ask any desired question. So you can really start to focus more on that strategic research. You can even start defining persona levels within here as well. So maybe, you know, you want to say, hey, users that are on our starter plan, what's, you know, stopping them from moving forward and actually being a paid customer, or again, maybe different um, persona levels, buyer versus end user, and really start to, again, focus more on that strategic research. All of this is exportable, so we have a lot of customers that even gather the data within Sprig, see the themes, and then export this data onto any other data visualization tool as well. Well, great. So that was a pretty high overview of you know, our in-app surveys, how we can customize, how we can target, and then how Sprig analyzes the data from those close-ended and open-ended questions there. Um, did we have any questions about the platform itself? We do have one, Denise. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, Beth, I'm gonna allow you to talk real quick so you can ask your question. Hey, Beth. Beth, are you there? Maybe she just wants to type the question. If not, um, we do have one also from Luke. How would you tie private data, tie private data to your company that your company has like revenue or features that the user used to their Sprig data? Yeah, good question. So essentially what's really great about Sprig is we don't collect any of da any data by default. It's really up to your team to define what data essentially or what these user attributes are also called to a user profile. So for instance, you know, you don't have to send us any PII. Um, and what's great is you can send over, again, let's say it's plan type, maybe it is location or role type of the user, maybe customer segment or a, a unique grouping category that you utilize um, within Sprig to attach it to a user profile. You can see their responses. 
But again, you can always export this data out and then combine that data that you're gathering within Sprig to any additional rev revenue data, um, either in a CRM or another product analytics tool if you wanted to dive in deeper. Um, so it is a mix of both. You have flexibility of sending those user attributes or user segments tied to a user. Um, and then again, combining the, the responses within Sprig to your other product analytics tools or CRM tools. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight Ben's comment um, that he found integration Sprig has with amp uh, platforms like Amplitudes to be super valuable. Uh, yes, exactly. So we have, you can tie responses into Slack. You can also, if you have an account with Mixpanel, easily just connect your Mixpanel account. There's no need for engineering. Same thing with Amplitude. If you're utilizing tools like Segment, what's really great is, again, Segment can be utilized to send this to any other tool that you're connected with. And then we also have integrations with LaunchDarkly. So if you had, you know, that A-B testing that you wanted to use for in-app surveys and you wanted to, again, target users that are on a B test versus an A test, you can actually connect um, your account there and start targeting users based off of that as well. And then if not, if you don't see a tool on here, you know, we have a lot of customers that utilize Tableau. Um, and again, using tools like uh, Snowflake or instances like that. So you can always use our data export API and webhooks and our integrations are very user friendly. Again, with any additional tool that again, you don't see that we have a native integration with. And um, one more question from Luke. Can you put Sprig into other platforms besides web, like iOS or SMS? Yes, we do have integrations with iOS and Android and React Native. We also have native integrations with Segment if you're utilizing those as a tool. Um, so you'll get all of the same benefits that you just saw me walk through, that same kind of targeting, the same customization for any of your mobile apps. We have a lot of customers that are mobile only focused um, that again are utilizing Sprig for both iOS and Android. Thanks, Denise. And we have one last question from Rudy. This one's actually for Ben. Um, there are healthy debates on how ICPs can be used to measure product market fit. Example, survey results for questionnaires indicating that 40% of more respondents cannot do without your product. Does Ben have any thoughts on these approaches? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of um, I don't know if you've read uh, the, I think it's quite infamous now, the superhuman blog on how they went about measuring product market fit. And of course, kind of a lot of that questioning line of questioning originated with Sean Ellis as well. Um, I'm actually a big fan of that technique in, in informing whether, you know, the, the classification of whether we've uh, reached product market fit. I think there are other signals. I don't think it can be something that you can uh, use in isolation, um, but but I think it's a valid input. And in the context of, of ICPs, similarly, I think it's a, a super useful uh, data point, but not something that uh, that is, you know, your sole input there. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, I wanted to say thank you so much to Ben and Denise. This has been incredibly helpful and educational. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and your thoughtful questions. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email with the recording. And um, thanks again. Hope everyone has a nice day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.